In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire completely destroyed the city. Rebuilding on the shores of Lake Michigan took 10 years, and the result was one of the largest cities in the United States of America. The only thing missing in Chicago was a grand urban monument to be a symbol of the city's new status. In 1886, a group of businessmen collected $3 million and decided to build one. This was to be the auditorium building, a new type of building, to be under the double aegis of profit and culture. For culture, there was the opera, the biggest in the world, open to all, democratic, and thus loss-making. For profit, there was a luxury hotel and offices to offset the deficit and enrich the shareholders. The opera, hotel, and offices were all housed in the same edifice, the most prestigious in the city. The complex was called the auditorium, rather than the opera, to emphasize the innovative character of the enterprise. The project was entrusted to the engineer Dankmar Adler and his young associate, the architect Louis Sullivan, the author of one of the most famous formula in the history of modern architecture. Form follows function. Chicago is built beside the lake. The downtown buildings were piled along a narrow strip on the shore of Lake Michigan. If it was to serve its purpose, the auditorium could not be built anywhere else but in this wealthy area that was already overcrowded in 1886. Negotiations were undertaken with no fewer than six different landowners to acquire a parcel of land on the lakefront, on the very edge of the city center, a narrow plot between three main roads that were to dictate the outer shape of the project. The hotel would be on the prestigious Michigan Avenue, overlooking the lake. The offices were to be on the city side, on Wabash Avenue, a commercial highway. A high tower marked the changeover from offices to hotel. Today, the premises are occupied by Roosevelt University that acquired the building in 1947. But from the outside, it still looks the way that Sullivan designed it. The facades are stern spaced only by big vertical pilasters, overdrawn to stress the size of the building. Nothing protrudes, there are no superfluous details, nothing of the decorative fantasies associated with theaters in Europe. The effect is deliberate. Sullivan belonged to a young generation of architects who were trying to get away from European traditions in order to define a specifically American style. His compatriots recognized themselves in these monumental arches that for some people symbolized the primitive strength, the almost barbaric energy that belonged to the young American nation, while for others, they were the evocation of the great civic works that were the glory of the Roman Empire. The facade gives no hint of the real function of the building. It makes its statement as a monument, which is emphasized by the construction method of using traditional masonry, entirely in stone, granite for the first two floors, ashlars for the upper stories. The foundations have to take the total weight of the structure. The higher the building, the thicker the foundations have to be, which is the reason for these great blocks of solid granite, the monolithic and thick-set columns. Because of this limitation, very few buildings then were higher than six floors. This one is ten floors up to the cornice. They wanted to make the auditorium building the highest in the United States, so they added another seven stories and a huge campanile-like tower of 170 tons. 
Hidden behind the Egyptizing and the quaintly archaic aspect are water tanks for the hydraulic machinery in the theater and the lift which gives access to the topmost story that was entirely reserved for Adler's and Sullivan's offices. Never before had such a high edifice been built using traditional masonry structure techniques. But the auditorium was built at a pivotal moment. When it was inaugurated in 1889, the use of metallic structures, which freed buildings from the constraints of stone and made the building of the first skyscrapers possible, spread like wildfire, especially in Chicago, where space was at a premium. Sullivan was the first to assert that this revolution in technique should be accompanied by a revolution in form, that the time had come to abandon the old-fashioned system of composition based on the predominance of the horizontal in favor of the vertical, which no line should be permitted to contradict. It was with this change in perspective that the break with the old continent was finally consummated. Although it was, for a few months in 1890, the tallest building in the world, the auditorium's tower was merely an extension to the building, the outward sign of its exceptional status. Hidden behind the shell of the facades was the heart and being of the whole project, the biggest theater in the world. The theater had no need of daylight. Adler and Sullivan placed it logically in the inner court of the building, which it completely filled, taking up more than half the total area of the structure. It is quite invisible from the outside. It is the tower that marks it in the most pragmatic way possible because it indicates the entrance. Sullivan moved away from the European model with his breathtaking entrances. At the foot of 17 stories of stone, the arcades giving entry to the biggest theater in the world look like mouse holes. The entrance hall, with its extraordinarily low ceiling, seems to be borne down by the weight of the building. Above it, a crypt-like foyer is reserved for the intervals. The decoration of the three staircases, based on plant patterns that Sullivan made geometric and practically abstract, was simplified at each successive floor, as was the fashion then. But at the same time, the whole space was restricted so that the main stairs of the great theater looked more like service stairs. This was far from the grand ceremonial staircase on which the fashionable patrons of the European operas like to display themselves. So while the Paris Opera has an entrance, staircases and foyers that take up a third of the building, those in the auditorium are reduced to the necessary minimum, two floors for the foyers and the narrowest possible segment for the stairs. The auditorium takes priority. Four thousand two hundred and fifty seats, twice the number of the Paris Opera. The difference was not just in the number. The whole general conception of the auditorium was quite new. It was the first great auditorium in the world to break away from the traditional horseshoe plan. There are practically no side seats here. 
all the spectators are in the best position facing the stage. The only concession was the boxes, but there are only 40 of them. They were put in at the express demand of the investors. Box users were not to be trusted, anti-patriotic, and part of the traditions of the old Europe, a journalist of the time explained. There is no place for them in our auditorium because it has to represent the present and the future, not the corrupt past. The present and the future meant democracy, of which Sullivan was highly partisan, and that showed itself here in the greater number of seats. 1,444 seats in the orchestra stalls, plus 1,632 seats in the extraordinary dress circle that looks like a stadium, plus 963 seats in the two balconies above it. Comparison, the stage is small and has a sad lack of off-stage storage space. At the time of building, there was no resident company to demand such facilities. The auditorium ate up the space that might have been used for workrooms. The dressing rooms and off-stage areas were reduced to the absolute minimum. If a scene requires a large number of extras, they are obliged to assemble under the stage amid the remains of the impressive hydraulic machinery that was previously used to raise various parts of the stage floor, an avant-garde special effect for grand opera. The stage was also equipped with an innovation that was most remarkable for its time. It was a system for flying out the sides of the proscenium arch to make the stage area continuous with the rest of the auditorium. The effective disappearance of the stage pushes the logic of the auditorium to its limits. Capacity was increased to 8,000 or even 10,000, so it was ready for modern American shows, sports meetings, great political rallies such as the Republican Convention that was held here in 1888 before the auditorium was finished. Nevertheless, the theater was dedicated to grand opera in French or Italian. The acoustic problem was on the same gigantic scale as the theater itself. Adler had decided to build the first scientifically designed auditorium, and he invented a new type of ceiling for it. He made it in the form of a conical tunnel with arches that increased in height and width the further they were set from the stage. This acoustic tunnel, rather like a speaking trumpet, makes it possible to diminish reverberation by diminishing the volume of the auditorium, to control the graduation while improving the diffusion of the sound. The tunnel ends at the level of the first balcony, giving way to a flat ceiling to which Adler attached a mechanism to adapt the acoustic to suit a reduced size auditorium. This flattered the ego of the divas who were spared the unpleasantness of playing to a half-empty house. A mobile flap weighing several tons reduces the size of the audience by several hundred. A final element completes the system, the stairs and public areas. Adler did away with all doors and walls so that the sound could circulate freely in the stairwell and flow through the whole of the rear part of the great theater. The stage is directly visible from the foyer on the first floor which produces a feeling of seeing something that goes beyond a simple technical prowess, something unthinkable in a European theater. Something as open and informal as these simple curtains that are closed at the start of the performance. Edison's incandescent lamp of 1890. 4,000 Edison lamps, 4,000 naked bulbs light up the auditorium.
No one can really tell where the engineer's work finishes and that of the architect begins. But the way in which Sullivan took over Adler's acoustic ceiling gives us a good idea of how well they worked together. The ceiling arches are in fact hollow tubes through which pass the whole of the ventilation and lighting systems. By outlining the arches with thousands of naked bulbs, Sullivan made them the dominant theme of the whole effect. The acoustic tunnel became a tunnel of light as well, attracting the eye and focusing it on the stage. The function establishes the form, which reconstructs the space. On the one hand is the simplicity of the naked bulb. On the other, the wealth and variety of features it shines upon. The rest of the auditorium is lighted in the same way. Only the light fittings and their arrangements change. The architect explores a series of variations on a single theme, playing with his bulbs like the cells that end up by making a whole living body. Nearby the elegant curves of the ceiling of the auditorium is another ceiling that looks like nothing known to the architecture of the 19th century. Its curve is the natural function of the pressure of the first balcony, just as a geological fold is a function of the pressure of terrestrial force. Instead of trying to hide this warp, the architect uses and amplifies it. Organism, structure, function, growth, form, all these terms imply the initial pressure of a living energy. We call this pressure the function and its result the form. The cohabitation of the three elements was designed to ensure the success of the venture. But the space taken up by the auditorium on a site that was too small upset the balance. In spite of their imposing facades, the offices in the hotel were no more than a thin shell surrounding the theater. In the eyes of the backers, the offices were the riskiest part of the operation. So the offices were made the smallest part of the building, no bigger than was strictly necessary. An iron staircase, industrial tiling that changed color on each floor, it could hardly have been plainer. Yet this was to be the most profitable part of the whole investment. The hotel, with one side on Congress Avenue and the main facade overlooking the lake, was given very special attention. A majestic entrance topped by a wide balcony, a vast and spacious hall, bathed in daylight, a handsome, richly decorated staircase. This is the opposite of the treatment of the auditorium, in which light and space were treated sparely. But after all, it was on the hotel and not the theater that the economic success of the enterprise depended. In the sumptuous dining room on the 10th floor that the university now uses as the library, the architect showed no interest in saving space. But then he stopped because there was no space left, because the hotel was a total improvisation. The backers were in a hurry to open, yet kept on wanting something new. The initial program was vague, this dining room, for example, was not included in the original working drawings. No more were the kitchens or staff bedrooms. They had simply been forgotten. But there was worse than that. In 1889, when the building was almost finished, they had at last an idea of consulting a specialist in hotel management, who immediately demanded an extra banqueting suite. Adler got down to work and designed this large room using a metallic structure, the only one in the whole building. Sullivan then undertook to decorate it, 
Setting it to music, as Frank Lloyd Wright, who started his architectural life on this site, was to say later. But where could they put it? There was no space left anywhere, except on the seventh floor of the building on the roof of the auditorium. The room, which is now used by the university as a concert hall, is perched on the roof, supported by two gigantic metal girders anchored on each side of the courtyard. This was an engineering exploit. Despite its luxurious decor, its fine sight, and the extraordinary success of the building, the lack of space was a serious handicap to the hotel, as well as the impossibility of having rooms on the courtyard, the very high running costs due to the complicated layout, and the traffic caused by the theater. The solution was, as so often, a headlong rush to the other side of the street, where two or three years after the opening, they built an annex, for which Sullivan designed an identical facade. An underground tunnel connected the two buildings. Not suffering from any of the main building's problems, the annex was soon in profit, to such an extent that it stood alone. The tunnel was filled in, and it became a rival establishment, depriving the auditorium hotel of its smart clientele. The downfall of the auditorium was also due to an urban setback. At the end of the 19th century, the bedding was on a new city development with Congress Street as its main thoroughfare. But the avenue remained the boundary between the prosperous district and the rest. the theater came down in the world. In spite of the perfection of its acoustics, it was soon rivaled by other, better sighted halls that were easier to fill. In 1929, the auditorium building was officially declared bankrupt. It was decided to demolish it. It was saved by its archaic building method. Because it was built in stone, demolition would cost more than the site was worth. In 1947, Roosevelt University, small and newly founded, was looking for a large and not too expensive building with a good image near to the city center. It bought the premises for $400,000. It also paid the outstanding taxes accumulated by the auditorium building and let the city of Chicago take part of the ground floor in order to widen Congress Street. In 1967, the theater was reopened and became, for a few years, the main city venue for rock music, the only one capable of housing Jefferson Airplane and Grateful Dead concerts. Today, it is just a venue like any other, or nearly. In theaters, it is usual to leave a permanent working light on the empty stage between performances and rehearsals, to keep ghosts away. Adler and Sullivan went their separate ways in 1896. Sullivan, at the peak of his reputation, stayed alone up in his tower. He was, for a time, the most fashionable architect. Then his wealthiest customers, seeing there was no Adler to give them confidence, went elsewhere. In 1918, he left his offices at the top of the tower because he could no longer afford to pay the rent. The view over the lake was replaced by a view of subway trains. Nowadays, this is a university corridor, but for three months it was his office on the second floor, before he left forever the grandest edifice he had built.
He died in 1924, poor but recognized by the young American architects as the first among them. Of the hundred or so buildings he designed in the course of his life, almost all have been destroyed.